just want you to know I don't have anything to sell you today. Uh, I, I, I spoke at ISSA last year, and I, some, on the, one of the comments that we got back, uh, they said, oh, you know, he was just trying to sell us something. I, I, may, maybe I, you know, tried to sell you to take a master's degree in security. I don't know. But um, so I'm really excited to, to talk to you this morning about uh, an, an idea I'm working on. Um, I've, I've been working on for, for the last year or so. It's called the Nine Cybersecurity Habits. So uh, what uh, uh, the, the, the genesis of the idea, uh, how many of you have read The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? Wow, okay, almost all of you. Um, so that, uh, that's exciting. Um, one of you, uh, 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 when you've listened to it in the past or read it or uh, however you, you took in that material, if it was a class, um, generally the seven habits focused on common traits of uh, successful people. Um, and I tried to uh, think about how we could do that in terms of cybersecurity. I, I, I wanted to call it the nine habits of highly effective cybersecurity people, uh, but I was pretty sure I'd get sued by Stephen Covey. So I'm just calling it the nine cybersecurity habits for now. Um, so uh, um, I think that cybersecurity is a behavior, not a, skill, not, not a competency. Um, so I, I think that's going to be the fundament, fundamental assumption I'm, I'm making for this morning. So if you don't believe that, um, uh, uh, hopefully I'll convince you, uh, but that's, that, that's the fundamental idea, right? When we train people, a lot of the training, the security awareness that we uh, talk about, um, it really focuses around building people's competencies. Um, and I, I think, you know, if, if you're like me, when you go out and talk to users, you talk uh, about training and awareness, um, generally speaking, what, what you find is they know the right answers. They, they, they can answer the, the, the correct questions on a quiz uh, when you ask them to spot red flags in, you know, in, in a vacuum. But in the wild, uh, what they're not doing, the reason why they're still clicking on those phishing messages, is they're fundamentally not changing the behavior. Um, so I believe that security is a behavior, not a competency. And we need to focus on behavior-based things and the things that govern behaviors are habits. Um, so yeah, I, I work in higher ed. Um, so uh, what we like to, to, to talk about in higher ed are, are frameworks or ped pedagogies. Um, and we don't have a pedagogy uh, for training people uh, around cybersecurity and, uh, and particularly around changing their habits. But guess what? The hackers have one. Have, 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 who, who's heard of the Lockheed Martin I, I like to say Lockheed Martin because it's, they, they trademarked it. The cyber kill chain, everybody heard of that? The attackers have a roadmap on how to train new hackers to, 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 to go into the wild. We don't have that same framework for our employees and we need one. Um, so hopefully the nine habits is a start. Um, uh, but uh, um, so instead what we have in cybersecurity, we, we, we give people hundreds, uh, if, if not thousands, of different tips on what you ought to do. Don't write your password down. Uh, don't click on this email. Um, and it, I don't know if any, anybody in here plays golf. I don't. Uh, I, I think golf is st stupid. Sorry. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, but I, I, I've seen it on TV. and. What, what you what you what you see uh, you know the 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 stereotypical golf swing analysis right do this don't do that focus on the ball bend your knees breathe right hold your back up straight follow through all of those are different types of tips and as a golfer not I'm not a golfer but if you're a golfer what do you do you know how do you keep all of those things in, in mind generally speaking when people start taking lessons whether it's tennis lessons or what have you uh, they, they start changing their swing and they start actually uh, getting worse before they get better. Um, and it may take years or, or, or you know, they may ruin their swing permanently. So what, what we need in, instead of giving people specific advice are, I, I think, uh, is a framework. And what I did is I took you know, the, the hundreds of different types of advice we give to people and I, I, I broke it down into what I think are nine categories of behaviors, um, nine distinct areas that we do things differently. So when we say, uh, uh, you know, change your password, really I think that's a, the habit of hygiene. Um, when, we, when we say well, you ought to look at what your social media profiles look like from, from, from the rest of the world, what I really think we're doing is talking about what I call mirroring. Um, if you guys have a better uh, name for that, I'm, I'm, I'm all ears. 
Um, so, okay. Um, I'm going to pause there on, on the habits because I think we need some, some background in order to get uh, to, to, to where I want to go with the habits. Um, so we talk in cybersecurity about this thing called a human firewall. Um, I don't think you really want to be a human firewall. I, uh, uh, this, this picture is actually from the third Matrix movie. This is actually uh, Agent Smith. I, I say that because nobody watched the third Matrix movie and maybe you couldn't place it. Um, so what, what I think we're talking about in terms of a human firewall is really about programmability and predictability, right? People fundamentally maybe are unpredictable and uh, we, we'd like to be able to program them as though they are a firewall. People are not a firewall, this is a problem, but we, we've come up with this marketing buzzword -y type term called the, the human firewall and I, I would challenge that. So right out of the gate, um, you know, it, it, I, I, I think I'm in a fairly sophisticated room. Um, it, the first type of firewall we, we, we invented in the universe was called a, a, a packet-based firewall. Um, but we very quickly realized that that wasn't efficient enough to scale into corporate environments. So uh, eventually someone invented this thing called uh, a, a stateful firewall. Right? I'm, I'm not going to explain what that is, but it's a more efficient way of handling things because you don't handle every packet. And the challenge is with people, we'll get into some of the neuroscience here, but people don't or can't be efficient by processing every email by scanning for red flags. That's just not how our brains are, are wired. We need to think differently about that. We need to think about the efficiencies of how people behave uh, in, in their lives. So, I mentioned that security is a behavior, not a competency. Um, Everybody has bad habits. Who, 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 in, who in the room is, is, is a saint and has no, okay, no, no hands in the, are, are going up in the room, good. Um, so uh, uh, we, we all know that social engineers uh, will uh, uh, exploit those bad habits, right? They wanna manipulate you um, into doing what they want you to do, whatever that happens to be. Um, and they do this by uh, uh, doing several things, right? They appeal to your emotions. Um, they uh, uh, tailgate, they pretext, right? They bait. Uh, all, all of those social engineering type of techniques that you'll probably learn about through the rest of the day if you haven't already uh, come across. Um, and so uh, uh, I, I guess the, the first thing I, I want to say is why do we believe anything that social engineers tell us, right? So uh, th they'll, they'll tell you that they are successful 100% of the time at uh, uh, exploiting people's uh, weaknesses or, or vulnerabilities or bad habits or whatever you want to call them. Um, uh, so I, I would first question, maybe that's not 100% uh, accurate, um, but just like drinking and smoking, uh, like the picture shows, um, we have bad habits, but guess what? We can change them. If human beings fundamentally can overcome the addictions of alcohol and, and, and nicotine and cigarettes, um, I think we can catch some red flags and some phishing messages. So uh, I, I, this is going to be a very optimistic uh, presentation if you hadn't guessed so far, but I, I, I think we, we, we can do it. It's just going to take some, some focus um, and some energy. And yeah, I don't think there are vendors out there that, that do this. Again, I'm not selling anything today, um, but uh, I, I think it's up to us as the security community to come together and to figure out ways of incorporating habits and changing behaviors um, and improving the, the situation so that we can get to get to a place where we're overcoming this. Um, and all that is to say, uh, my, my wife likes to say, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So maybe we don't ever get to 100%. Maybe the, the, the social engineers are right that there's somehow they're, they're gonna get in you know, from time to time, but even if we improve by just 10%, uh, if we improve by just 20%, if we take baby steps to get there, I think uh, it, it, it's possible. Um, so the human brain um, actually consumes 20% of the calories that you take in every day. So think about that for a minute. Your, 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 your brain, not a big part of your body, but it's sucking in a ton of energy. Um, the brain has to work efficiently, and it's been designed, evolutionarily speaking, to be efficient. Um, the, 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 the picture on the screen is, is a description of uh, this theory of uh, uh, brain evolution called uh, the triune brain theory. Um, so 
it's I, I, I like to think of it, this, this picture looks to me like, like it's a computer operating system, like it's hardware. Um, so the reptilian brain um, really talks about instincts, but there's a structure inside the reptilian brain that we've, we've started to learn a lot about called uh, the basal ganglia that, that governs, you guessed it, habits. That's what the talk is about. Um, <clears throat> so uh, th this, this, this habit uh, part of your brain is really interesting. Um, how many of you in, in the room remember what your drive was like this morning, right? So a, a couple, usually you're on autopilot, right? You know, may maybe that's a little different because you're coming to uh, Collin County Community College today and you had to figure out directions and you're thinking and you've got your, your phone telling you step-by-step -step directions. Generally speaking, you're on autopilot, right? If you're going to the same place every day, that, that reptilian brain is, is, is taken over and it's freeing up your brain uh, your, your neocortex to think about the more important things in life like Kim Kardashian's latest hijinks. Um, so I think this is the, uh, the, the fundamental uh, central question that, that I have for my presentation that, that I hope we'll, I'll be able to answer for you today. Um, but we can't and shouldn't try and change the way our brains work, right? This idea of the human firewall is interesting, it's cool, um, you know, it's, it's a flashy marketing thing. Um, but we, we can't change how our brains work. So how do we, uh, when you know people are in their daily lives checking email, checking hundreds of emails a, a, a you know a day potentially, um, how do we get them to 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 break out of the, uh, the the basal ganglia area and fire that message up 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 to the uh, the neocortex where the real uh, processing can happen? How how do we break out of that cycle? And you know I think. Um, the answer is uh, in the, right in the middle there. Um, so there's this weird structure um, that, that uh, neuroscientists call the limbic brain. Uh, it's the emotional uh, or, or, or feeling uh, brain. But the, uh, the, the idea is decision making in, in your brain doesn't happen actually in the neocortex. That's, that's some cool flashy processor stuff up there. But the, the, the frontal lobe of the limbic brain is where decision happens. Um, so here, here, here's the, the takeaway. Um, how, do, how do we break that habit loop? We get angry, right? If, if it, you know, again, going back to your drive to work, the drives into work that you remember are when someone cut you off, right? The, 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 you know, the coming into the, the house every day, maybe you remember to, to lock the doors, maybe not, maybe not, but the times that you're gonna remember are the times that you forgot or the times that someone broke in and you're gonna have that fear. Um, if the doors cracked open, um, that's going to be something that, that you remember that breaks that cycle. <clears throat> so I, I have this concept that, that I, I like to think of as purpose-driven cybersecurity, um, but they've done studies, and uh, for example, with medical doctors, um, they, they really want uh, surgeons to wash their hands a lot, right? This is, this is kind of a thing, but in some hospitals, not uh, hopefully not any, any of them in Dallas, but in some hospitals, they have a hard time getting the doctors to wash their hands enough. So what they've found, they've, they've tried all different things. They put up signs. They've, uh, you know, uh, uh, have incentive structures. The one thing that they found that, that gives the doctors uh, this, this, this concept of purpose that actually increases the, the amount that they wash their hands is they put up pictures of the patients, right? If you can connect emotionally to the people that you're helping, that you're trying to protect, um, that's going to resonate with the, the, the people that are doing the, that are in that habit loop, that are just doing their jobs, they're, they're trying to get everything done during the day. Um, I, I would say a takeaway might be, you know, your security awareness is cool. What if you included pictures of your employees, pictures of real stories from your employees or real stories from your customers? I think that's gonna move the needle. Um, habit loop. Um, there's a lot of literature over the last decade a lot of research in, into habits. Um, this picture comes from uh, a book called *The Power of Habit* by Charles Duhigg, um, a, another great book uh, that I, that I, I, I has been really influential for me. Um, but he, he describes this habit loop. So there's a cue, um, say it's three o'clock. Uh, that that cue generates a routine. Maybe I'm hungry and I'm going to go to the cafeteria, and there's a reward, an incentive for that routine to reinforce it. Uh, maybe I get a cookie when I go to the cafeteria. Um, but incentives are weird. So maybe for you, uh, it's the reward isn't a cookie. Maybe the reward is just taking a break from your day, getting
getting away from your desk. Maybe the reward for you is there's a bunch of people that all go to the cafeteria at three o'clock and you like spending time with them. You're an extrovert um, and that's energizing for you. Um, but to, to break out of that habit loop, um, you need a different cue and you need a different uh, routine. So you need to replace that. You need to have alternate rewards and you need to understand what those rewards were in the first place that were reinforcing those behaviors. It, I, I think that's a really interesting process to, to, to think about in terms of uh, the, the, the things that we're trying to, to change, like recognizing red flags on a, on a phishing email or um, not giving away information on, uh, over the phone by a social engineering call. Um, all, I think habit is what governs our behavior. Um, habits, the research has kind of shown, work like a muscle. They get tired. Um, they've done studies of kids, and when they uh, make, you know, have the kids focus their attention for long periods of time, and then they try and you know, uh, uh, get the kids to not eat a cookie in front of them, or uh, the, the, ac the actual experiments used marshmallows. Uh, but the kids that had uh, been exposed to high stimulation um, had less of a, a willpower, if you will, and didn't hold that long enough. And I think the same is true for our security habits. Um, they can get tired. Um, but the good news, just like a muscle, they can also get stronger. Um, the other takeaway that, that I thought was really interesting when I started thinking about habits as a muscle is muscles work in only one direction, right? So to move your arm, you need both a bicep and a tricep, right? You, you need a, an equal and opposite uh, complementary muscle to help move and, and, and target things. So we can't think of ourselves as... Arnold Schwarzenegger's, or we can't aspire to be all Arnold Schwarzenegger's with our security muscles, and then be, you know, George Finney's for our other everyday business muscles to get stuff done. We have to have uh, some some equality there. So I think that I'm I'm not going to go into this, but there there are a corresponding set of other business muscles that uh, uh, security muscles need to work in conjunction with, uh, in terms of habits to uh, to to get stuff done. Um, this is really interesting for me. For, so the, the, the slide is measurement. And we don't have a way today of, I, uh, like with firewalls or antivirus, I can go to NSS labs and I can see which one is more effective at catching uh, viruses. Uh, I can see which ones have better signatures. I can see which are more effective. Maybe there's some tuning that I have to do. But I, you know, generally speaking, I can compare and contrast. I can't compare and contrast whether the SAN securing the human training is better or more effective than the Wombat or Fish Labs or No Before training, right? There, there, there isn't anything uh, there. And I think part of the problem is, you know, in cybersecurity, we're teaching to the test. Um, there isn't a framework. There isn't a pedagogy to be able to say, well, what are the behaviors we're trying to influence? What are the outcomes? And how do we improve them? Um, there are uh, leading um, indicators of uh, of those behaviors, those measurements, and they're lagging ones. So we also focus on the lagging indicators, right? So we, we say, well, there's a click-through rate for simulated phishing campaigns, or we see account compromises, therefore there's something there. But gosh, wouldn't it be awesome if there were a way to have some leading indicators so that you knew before an incident happened that there was some kind of indicator that that was going to happen. Those kind of leading indicators are there in the stock market. We found them in other areas. I think there's a way to find them in cybersecurity. So I'll throw out an example. Um, they've, they've done some studies, again, about employee effectiveness and uh, uh, measuring the, the ability to, to, to do reasoning. And what they found is people that are, are forced to make decisions quickly make bad decisions more often than people who have uh, uh, more time. And I would say we, we talk in, uh, a lot about culture in cybersecurity as though we ha really have the ability to influence culture at all in our organizations. But one thing that I think may vary from culture to culture is maybe how quickly you are asked to respond to email, right? In some businesses or in some uh, cultures, responding to an email in 10 minutes is the norm. It's demanded of you. Uh, may I think it's professional still to respond within uh, 24 hours. But I think if we looked at measuring that as, as, as one of the things we look for as a leading indicator, maybe there would be some kind of way where we can uh, uh, correspond uh, employees who click on red flags and phishing emails to uh, uh, some kind of leading indicator that would measure 
a better outcome. I don't know if that's a good one or not. I haven't been able to test it yet, but that's just something to, to, to start to get you thinking about uh, uh, what, what I'm kind of talking about. Um, but like a muscle, habits can be measured. So that uh, we're thinking max reps, right? We're thinking uh, endurance, we're thinking speed, the time that it takes your muscles to recover after you've worked them out. All of those things we measure for muscles, and I think we can find good ways of measuring it for cybersecurity. Okay, are you ready for the nine habits? We're gonna jump right in. That, that, that was all preamble, we're, we're, we're ready to go. Okay, um, so uh, shameless self-promotion, I wrote a book. Um, the, the, the nine habits is probably gonna be the next book, but the first book came out last year. Um, I'm gonna give a copy away if you can answer the, the pop quiz question, who this is. Socrates, who, you said it first? All right. Uh, his, his name is actually pronounced Socrates. I, I heard it in Bill and Ted. Uh, I, 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 I haven't, haven't changed it since then. Um, so a little known fact about Socrates is that um, he uh, uh, went to the Oracle at Delphi when he was really young. Um, and the Oracle at Delphi, uh, if, if you know your Greek history, uh, told Socrates that he was the smartest man in the world. Did we know that Socrates was the smartest man in the world? Um, okay, stunned silence. Great. So um, why was Socrates uh, the, the smartest man in the world? Um, I, I won't belabor this, but um, Socrates himself said that he was the smartest man in the world because he knew that he didn't know anything. Right? Everybody else professed to know everything about everything, and Socrates Maybe he was just as dumb as everyone else, but at least he realized that he didn't know anything. And I think that, that, that's the first takeaway for our first habit of literacy. Um, you can't assume that you know anything. Our, our environment in cybersecurity is constantly changing, right? You, you apply a, a patch and suddenly everything's broken. Um, you know, if, if you're in law enforcement, you go into a room, if you're gonna clear a room, um, you don't assume that you, you know, the guy holding his hands up is the only guy in the room, right? This, 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 is, this is what literacy is about. It's, it's about constantly relearning and adapting to your environment, right? You're, you know that your environment is, is always gonna be changing. We, we should all understand this as a part of cybersecurity. Um, it's great for the people in the room, but what about all our non-technical friends out in, 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 in our uh, businesses and, and corporations and, and, and colleges? Um, that, that, you know, in higher ed, we call it lifelong learning. We need to, to be committed to constantly uh, uh, refreshing our, our, our information. Habit number two, skepticism. So uh, this is a picture uh, from the movie Hitch, um, but Will Smith is not the exemplar here. Um, each habit, I've, I've chosen an exemplar of, of the habit. It's actually Eva Mendez is, is, is my uh, exemplar. So um, uh, uh, fun story. Um, I, I hired a social engineer to come through SMU several years ago, and they they swore up and down that uh, you know they were gonna you know nobody was gonna catch them. They were gonna get out scot free. I'm like, okay, well maybe you don't need this get out of jail free card uh, that my police force will listen to. Oh no no, let's let's definitely get that um, just in case, right? Again, don't believe everything that a social engineer tells you. I think is one of the takeaways of this talk. But um, okay, so they, uh, they they came on campus. Literally within 30 minutes of them coming to campus, I, I got my, my phone rang. Hey, we've caught these guys. Or they, they say they're with you. Really? What's going on? Um, the, the, the department that caught them was our school of theology. Right? So, you know, I, think about this for a second. So, um, you know, uh, if, if you're a professor or, or, you know, you've got a school of theology, what do they, what do they study? They, they, they study religion, but, you know, they're also maybe perhaps some of the best skeptics on, on our campus. It's a really interesting idea that perhaps, uh, you know, skepticism is, is what, you know, we need to embody in terms of uh, uh, improving our cybersecurity. So I, I picked that as a, as a second habit. Um, the, uh, the reason I picked the slide and, and Eva Mendez as, as, as my exemplar um, so if, if you've read any of the literature on uh, what pickup artists are like, I, I don't recommend that you read this. It's incredibly sexist literature. Um, but uh, what, 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 what the pickup artists will say is, well, they're about effective maybe 10% of the time, and it's a numbers game, and they just want to get in front of as many people as, as they want. So why the difference? 
this, this, is, this is my question. Why, how, how come, you know, I, I think essentially what they're doing is the same thing. I think they're both doing social engineering. Pickup artists are just, you know, a very specialized genre, perhaps, of, of social engineer. Uh, wh wh what's, what's the difference between the two that makes one more successful than the other? Uh, I, I think that goes to a lot of uh, cultural norms um, uh, and, and other things. But I, I think that's, that, that, that's really interesting to, uh, to think about how uh, we might move the needle a little bit. But uh, Eva Mendez, obviously, if you saw the movie, was very skeptical, right? You know, it, you know sh she was willing to say, uh, no, I'm not going to go out. Like, you, uh, you, your, your cheesy pickup line is not going to work on me. Um, if, if we can get our, uh, our, our people to embody that, um, I, I think we, we, we move the, the needle a little bit. Um, I started out thinking about um, secure, uh, skepticism specifically as a spectrum, right? It, you know, you go from, you know, the, the, the trusting, uh, uh, gullible person on the one end of the, the spectrum uh, to the, you know, Eva Mendez on the opposite end of the spectrum. And uh, there, there's this book, again, by Stephen Covey's son, uh, also Stephen Covey. Um, uh, who uh, he, he comes up with this idea of uh, it, the book is this, the speed of trust um, fascinating read as well um, but he, he he has this idea that it's actually a matrix not a spectrum and you can have in, uh, both high trust as well as high um, analysis uh, in, in my terminology skepticism to arrive at what he calls smart trust or good judgment and I, I think you need both I, I'm, I'm bought into this matrix concept um, I think you need both in order to accomplish things uh, in, in life. I, I, this goes back to the, the, the muscle analogy, right? I think you need a, a complementary muscle. So perhaps this, the complementary muscle to, uh, to, to skepticism is trust, right? So to, to give you a flavor of uh, what uh, you know, habits working in conjunction can, can look like. So uh, back when I started out my career, I, I, I was working at uh, AT&T, uh, at one of their first uh, network operations center, I worked the graveyard shift. And uh, I, I had worked my first full shift and I was supposed to get some training at the end of my first full graveyard shift. This was a terrible idea. Um, so if, if, if you've worked on a graveyard shift, especially the first night that you worked on a graveyard, I was actually up for 24 hours straight and the guy is telling me, okay, I'm, I'm sitting down, I'm the one that's supposed to drive. And he points to the file menu, go to file and I'm looking and I can't see it. Like, I'm, I'm not kidding. I literally couldn't, like, file. What the hell are you talking about? Like, where? Like, point to it? Like, what? Um, I, I was too exhausted. Again, you know, the, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm overemphasizing this idea that muscles can get tired. But I, I, I ran out of what I think is the vigilance habit. Um, so uh, uh, there are professional uh, Where's Waldo uh, searchers. Um, and th they've, they've come up with this algorithm. Um, so if, apologize if, you, if, you, if it's, uh, you can't see it very well on the screen, but essentially they, they've taken where Waldo has been and all of the pictures that he's been and come up with this algorithm that you, know, you can do a fast search to just scan for finding Waldo. Incidentally, I've not been able to find where's Waldo on this picture. He may not be in it. He may be in it. I don't know. I, I, I just decided to call it and... Give that man a book. Teach me a thing or two. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, w what are ways you can be vigilant? You, 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 I, I think scanning, um, but also filtering. So what I do is, um, and maybe this is bad advice because I couldn't find Waldo, but um, you know, I, I like to filter out the rest of the picture, right? Make a little circle with your hand and scan. And if I'd only done that a little higher, maybe I, maybe I would have actually found him at the top there. Um, so this is the challenge, right, for, for folks working graveyard shift or folks who uh, have been drained of their, their vigilance. Um, how, do you, how do you keep that vigilance going? I think that's a big challenge. Um, so um, I, I, I'd like you to think about your deepest, darkest secret that you've never told anyone in your life. Think, think about. Uh, uh, what you would tell me, uh, you don't have to tell me. Think, think about what that is. Now, pair off into groups and tell 
uh, the person sitting next to you. No, you're not going to do that? What? Okay. Um, so you all have a really good habit of secrecy, right? You, you've, you've got some great secrets in the room. I can't, you know, I can't imagine what all kind of secrets you guys are keeping. Um, my exemplar, I think, you know, it's, maybe it's too on the nose, but I picked James Bond, um, who protects those secrets. But um, so if, if I can summarize the first four secrets so far, uh, uh, you need to read habit number one, literacy. Habit number two, skepticism. Maybe you shouldn't believe everything that you read. Um, habit number three, you, now that you've you know, started know what to look for, maybe you should start looking for it. Um, habit four, well, maybe you ought to know at this point what it is you're trying to protect, right? Maybe that's social security numbers, maybe it's uh, uh, other things uh, in your environment, trade secrets and higher education, maybe I should be worried about uh, protecting critical research. Um, those are all uh, uh, great examples, but um, and, and at the end of the day, it's about protecting your, your, your secrets. Goodwill Hunting. Um, if you recall the movie, maybe, maybe not, it's, it's been a while. Maybe not everybody's seen it, but Matt Damon, the, Matt Damon's first movie, um, he played a you know super genius janitor uh, who was uh, cleaning up the the halls at, at Harvard and solving the world's pr hardest math problems on the board just for fun before he uh, er erased them. Um, and somebody finds out, and oh, oh my gosh! Well, I think the takeaway here is um, even if you're the world's smartest person. Uh, you, you still got to uh, brush your teeth. You still got to uh, take a shower. Uh, you know, that, maybe that's debatable sometimes. Uh, um, but uh, you, you need hygiene, right? So what is a hygiene? A hygiene is a routine. Um, and routines, it's in cybersecurity, we're, we have a really hard time creating routines. Uh, we don't change our passwords, you know, but how often do you change your passwords? Once every month, once every three months, once, once a year? Um, you know, Google or Yahoo or those organizations, uh, if, if you're at a commercial bank, they don't make you change your password. Um, this is an interesting problem, and I think, well, ha you know, again, we talk about habits and having that loop. It's hard to create a habit um, if, if there's, you know, infrequent routines. So I think ch making the, the, those, those routines frequent is, is, is an interesting option, right? What if, thought exercise, what if you change your password every day? Maybe, okay, maybe that's a bad example. What if you changed one password on each of your accounts that you have every day? Maybe it's you know not your corporate account. Maybe today it's your personal email. Maybe tomorrow it's your other personal email. Maybe tom the day after that it's uh, your social media account. Maybe after that it's a bit. But after a period of time, the research actually says um, it may take two to three months to create and, and, and build a habit that's going to last. Um, but the idea is cr figure out a way of creating routine. Uh, so once you've started to uh, build a routine, guess what? There, there are lots of different types of hygiene, uh, types of routines that you need to do to actually be secure. You, you're not one and done. So I think diligence, um, I, I'm an attorney, I'm sorry, um, but uh, this, this actually is Matlock. If you don't know who Matlock is, he was one of the most famous TV attorneys in the 80s, All, won every case that he ever uh, did and part of what Matlock's uh, shtick was uh, was that he was just really super diligent. Um, I think in terms of due diligence. So, uh, but what really I'm talking about is creating a plan, right? If you've got multiple habits that you need to coordinate, how do you do that? You need to have a plan uh, for all of them coordinating together. And as cybersecurity people, generally we're called on to create plans not just for one individual but our entire organization. How do we coordinate all of those activities that you're doing in cybersecurity? Uh, into one uh, organized structure. I think that's uh, a, a challenge, and we call it diligence. I'm calling it diligence. Um, I'm a Trekkie. I apologize in advance for the uh, bad Star Trek pun. I picked the name Federation um, for obvious reasons. I'm sorry. So once you've got a plan, you need to start coordinating with other people. So maybe that's your personal plan um, and you need to coordinate with your family, right? Your uh, spouse or your children, you need to coordinate together so that you, all of your plans uh, are working in conjunction. Um, 
I'm not going to talk too much about uh, Jean-Luc Picard, uh, my, my favorite Star Trek character. Um, actually, second favorite. L Locutus is probably my, my favorite uh, Star Trek character. Um, so I'm sure you all are now like trying to figure out what my passwords are based on uh, my pro proclivities, um, like the good social engineers uh, you are. Um, so working with law enforcement, right? Um, you, you're going to need to work with outside entities. You're going to need to bring in consultants uh, to, to do pen testing or to, to, to have some level of trust. Um, you're you're going to need to work with other people in, in order to actually accomplish your goal of being cyber secure. And once you start working with other people toward your goal of being cyber secure, uh, what you're going to need to do is figure out what you look like to them so that you're not leaking information about yourself to them. So, you know, it, you know, you, we, we talked earlier on about what, what mirroring might look like, but mirroring, I think, in, in its personal state is what, what, what do you have posted on your social media and what's viewable to the people you're connected with and the rest of the world, the public? Um, you know, have, have, have you, how many in, in, uh, people in the room have Googled themselves within the last six months? Um, that's awesome. Um, how do we get our, our, our employees to, to do that? How do we get our families to do that? I think making it personal, making cybersecurity personal for uh, the people around us is how we get people to buy in. And this is one of the, one of the easiest ways to, to get them in. And maybe you can flip it. Maybe instead of you know, just telling them, hey, why don't you Google so, yourself? Why don't you Google me? See, see, what you, see what you find. Sit down with your kids. And instead of telling your kids you've got to do X, Y, and Z on social media or else the world is going to end, why don't you challenge them to say, hey, what can you see about me on my social media? Right? You hold yourself up as an exemplar. Maybe they'll find something interesting about you that you didn't know was out there. And oh my gosh, you can you know, uh, uh, improve both your and n now your kids uh, have, have something to, 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 an example to hold on to and move forward with. The example, uh, obviously, I'm, I'm a, also a big music fan. So Man in the Mirror, Michael Jackson. OK. Um, uh, you know, I don't, don't want to assume everybody knows who Michael Jackson is anymore. Um, I know it's way, way, way old. Um, you know, um, OK. Last habit, deception. So as, as you can imagine, I think as, as you work from habit number one all the way up to habit number nine, there, there, there I think is a maturity that, that, that goes along with those, right? So um, w when I've measured m my habits at, at, at SMU, um, I, I found that you know, mirroring and deception are, are some of the hardest ones to, to actually accomplish. So you know, focus on the first one, build your way up to this. Um, deception, at, at, at its most basic level, we tell people to lie on their password challenge questions. Don't tell me the truth because, uh, you know, go, go back as far as, I, my favorite example is 2008 in the presidential uh, campaign when Sarah Palin was announced as the, the mavericky vice presidential candidate. You know, whatever your feelings are about her, her password challenge question to her personal Yahoo email address was, guess what, where she was from. Everybody knows where Sarah Palin is from. Um, that's not a great password challenge question. You need to lie. So where are you from, duck-billed platypus? Not going to guess that one. Um, so uh, uh, other other deceptions. Something we do. Our our uh, our, our parents like to um, know what their students' grades are uh, at SMU. And if you're an adult, that you know, even if you're paying the bills, your parents don't have access, right? So we get people calling in. Hey, you know, tell me what my grades were. Well, Johnny, what class do you have at 3 p.m. on Thursday? Maybe that's a trick question. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe Johnny doesn't have a class, but only Johnny's going to be the one to know that. And you know, okay, well, I don't know. I forgot. Like, okay, I haven't gone to class in a while. Like, you, you, you we hear all of these different things. But deception, if if you're a magician, um, is about anticipation. It's about preparation. It's about planning. So, who had a uh, a, a kid uh, magic kit when you were a kid? Just one, two. Okay, okay, a handful. Right. So. Um, what, what did you find out as soon as you bought that magic kit? You, you didn't become a magician day one, did you? Um, no, it's not. It's not. It takes a, years of, of, of practice, of, of you know, to get maybe even one good card trick. Um, so deception is, is is a big challenge, and I think it takes a lot of preparation. It takes a lot of planning. It takes a lot of uh, uh, foresight. Okay. That's the last slide. 
Um, <laughs> what questions do you have? Questions? Chris Angel, sorry. No, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, okay. He is a uh, famous Las Vegas uh, magician. He's got his, uh, uh, I, 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 I don't really want to talk about Chris Angel that much, but he's kind of got a TV show, and he's like the Kardashian of magicians. It's, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> what other questions do you guys have? So, the, so the, the the question is, um, why do we need to change our passwords at all? And it's actually, um, I, I appreciate the question. It's actually not not a bad question. It's a really good question, and it's one that all of my users ask me almost every day. Why do I have to keep changing my password? Um, and it, uh, the the previous speaker mentioned NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. They've really really screwed us because they they say now that yeah we, we you don't need to change your your passwords anymore. You've got two-factor. You've got other stuff. Um, so recall back to, I think, 2013 when LinkedIn got hacked, uh, right? They, they had hashes of their passwords, but they hadn't salted their, their, their hashes. Um, so they were really easily able to, to go in and uh, 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 reverse engineer. And so they, they had to go uh, tell all of their users to reset their passwords, right? That was the only way that, that they could uh, do uh, to, to, to ensure their, their customer um, um, integrity. Uh, you saw little pop-ups when you logged into LinkedIn said, change your password now. Really, 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 you should do that. Um, but yeah, our, our users don't buy that. Um, and I think that's, to, to me, that's a part of, uh, you know, we're, I think, hiding the, the dangers of the internet from our users, right? We don't give them enough information uh, to make good risk-based decisions about the, the environment they're, that they're in. If you're in the bad part of town, um, if you go, I'm sorry, I'm going to pick on the State Fair. If you go to the State Fair of Texas, um, probably you've been conditioned to know that maybe you ought to move your, your wallet from your back pocket to your front pocket so that you know, like, you know, maybe if you're carrying your purse, you know, you ought to throw that over your shoulder so it can't get, you know, snatched. Right? When you're about a bad part of town, you change your behavior. Um, and, you know, we, we, I think, in security do a great job of, you know, at least providing that, that entry-level security. But... Uh, our end users, are, you know, don't, aren't exposed to that. So I think giving information to them will will help them understand the the risks. The the previous speaker talked about rainbow tables being extended out to to 14 characters. I mean that's that that's a you know terrible state of affairs. Um, so yeah, passwords. Get, you know, you know I, I see. Uh, you know, I I I've signed up for this service. I see you know every day I, a, a new number of employee uh, email addresses have been. Uh, attached to some sort of uh, uh, hack, or, or you know, they've been uploaded to Pastebin. I don't know necessarily that that means that my SMU uh, uh, users have actually been compromised. Maybe they signed up for some third-party service, and that other service got compromised. But every day, it's you know, maybe it's one or two, maybe it's a thousand. Um, it, it's happening constantly. Great question. Thank you. Totally. We, we use them at, at SMU, right? So um, I, I think you can change uh, your employees' habits. I, I think the, the, the point of the, 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 the identifying the nine habits is, now that we've identified them, let's figure out ways of, of improving them. So I think what, what's available commercially, particularly with the simulated phishing products, um, Wombat, uh, FishMe, KnowBefore, those, you know, for, for those of you that don't do simulated phishing, that's a great way to start out with changing users' habits. Uh, we started out, uh, we, we had maybe a 40, 50% click-through rate. We've been, you know, it took three years, uh, but we're now down, you know, we've been consistently below 5% uh, in terms of click-through rate. That's, that's a really great place to be, and there's a really well-defined ROI that you can say, look, we, we were hacked, 
But if we weren't hacked, or we, if we hadn't been doing this, this simulated phishing campaign over the last however many years, this would have been the cost. And here's the, so I, I think that's really valuable. But I think those products are limited to the first three uh, uh, habits. I don't, I don't know that anything beyond habit three is really something that's available in the marketplace for us to, to go and, 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 and do something with. So you know, I, I think as, as a CISO, as, as a community of security, um, we owe it to our users to be able to do better. Um, and you know, we, I, I like to say we focus, on, you know, in security we have people, processes, and technology, right? We focus entirely on the technology, right? 99% of all of your budgets, I guarantee you, is focused on technology. And we're, we're focusing to the point where um, you know, we're trying to get you know, the users out of it, right? And I think to our own detriment, right? You know, th that, that's called being, you know, trying to create some, a plan that's foolproof. I, I hate that that, that concept. Um, so h how do how do we get people back involved? It goes to the the first question. Uh, we need to get them information. Uh, we need to give them the tools, just like we have, to to be able to respond uh, in in better ways. There's another question over here. Um, so. I think it depends on your corporate culture, your environment, what the right model is. I, I would say the first thing you would ought to do. Um, I built a survey um, that you know secret. You know, I got you know I gave away Starbucks gift cards to to get people to take the survey. Not everybody took the survey, but I was actually able to kind of you know start to triangulate, start to measure some of the habits. People didn't know that I was measuring habits. It was kind of one of those blind questionnaires. Um, so I, I think you can you can do something similar to that. Um, Find the you know the weak spots in your environment. Uh, look at you know different departments. Maybe you can target different departments differently. Uh, but you know start with the basics. Uh, you know, get get people information. Start to start to build that habit. I mentioned that you know it takes the research says two to three months to 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 actually change a habit. So don't try and do all nine today. Um, it's going to take you know a, a, a approximately 27 months if you do them sequentially. Um, but find your weak spots. Find uh, things that are going to resonate with people in your environment. You know, you want to establish successes in order to keep get people bought in, and then you know keep moving that needle forward. And guess what? The other problem with uh, the 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 individual, uh, the FBI guy or Secret Service guy earlier mentioned, our our security awareness training is the same every year. That's a problem, right? In higher education, if if I had if I gave people the same you know English 101 course every year after year, well you know we wouldn't have an industry, right? How do we have progressive training so when you start with a new employee, they have a roadmap to, to, to improve? And guess what? You know, maybe you know, just like with college, you can place out of some uh, things because you've tested and maybe you're good in that area. Um, I, I think we, we've got to think more broadly about how we progress and how we customize that training for an individual, not just for you know, our whole organization. It's easy just to press that button. Here's, you know, if, if you're lucky enough to have mandatory training, um, you know, here's what we, you know, what we give everyone. It's the same every year. I, I, th I think that's got to change. Great, great, great question. Thank you. Any others? Cool. Um, I, I think honestly, the best advice is to use a passphrase. So pick your favorite song. Pick a random, you know, lyric out of the song that's 20 characters long. Yeah, so we, we've done a terrible job lately of, or uh, I mean, over the last 20 years about making passwords too hard to remember. Um, so special characters, you know, you know, they don't matter now, right? With the rainbow tables being out there, with the, uh, the, the, the power of computing, you know, special characters, you know, for a short password have the same entropy as a longer password with, with, with less of them or without any. Um, so I, I think, again, if you go out to, a 20, 30 character long password, um, that that password is going to be far more secure in a lot of different ways for a lot of different reasons. Um, the, the, the problem with that is users are going to stop wanting to type in, you know, uh, uh, a 30 character long password, you know, 20 times a day. So part of our, our journey in cybersecurity can be, we're, you know, we get it, we, you're, you're, you know, passwords suck. Um, here's a way, single sign on, right? We're going to, we're going to, Streamline your, your user experience throughout the course of your day in order to accommodate these longer passwords. Um, so it's and again, like I, I mentioned, it's a muscle. It's a balancing test. 
Um, and I think you need to understand both aspects of it. You need to understand the, the user's perspective, the business habits that go along with, with those things that you're trying to, to move the needle on when it comes to security. Uh, so when, when users are yelling, um, it, the, you know, you need to move the needle back the other way. Um, I, uh, un unfortunately, uh, that, I think the problem for us is in, on the security muscle side, we don't know how strong we need to be, right? H well, we don't have, well, I talked about those leading indicators. If we had better measures uh, on the security side about how secure we needed to be, we, we could make that, that test better. So I think the answer is actually, let, you know, let's find better measurements to, uh, to, to figure things out. I think we're incredibly much immature. I, I mean, again, when 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 I say, you know, less than one percent of our budgets are, are are spent toward you know uh, uh, any kind of user awareness and training, um, th th there there there's a reason for that, right? The only kinds, you know, there there are only two examples I'm aware of of security education or training that that you can get. It's either a, um, you know, a v online video or b simulated phishing message. That's it. Um, I you know. A, a, yeah, I, I, I think it's going to be a real challenge. So I think we're the answer is we're fairly mature. Back at the back. Um, so, gosh, yeah. The, the the question is okay. Now that I've got this framework, uh, put your money where your mouth is. How, you know, how have you been able to to move the needle? Um, so lots, lots of different ways. So I, I only set out my first uh, survey last year. So I, I want to be sensitive to user fatigue. I'm going to, I'm going to wait, a, you know, a full year to, to send out the next one. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that needle is moved. Um, uh, but uh, you know, I've, I've done a lot of different things, right? So we have an annual cybersecurity awareness fair where I get people in person to come, and um, the incentive structure is. I give away some free vacation days for people to show up and participate. Um, I had I had lock picking booths, the same things that we've seen at, at some of these events that keep get people interested and excited. Um, uh, you know that gets them interested. Making it personal gets them to to be more involved. Um, but I want to be cognizant that I need to build relationships with people in order to get them to to tell me things, to 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 let me know when there's been a problem. Right? There's I think in a lot of corporations an incentive structure not to tell that there's been a security incident, right? I can't be I, I can't create a, a negative user environment, and I, that that's that's what I worry about with you know particularly with simulated phishing or social engineering or some of those other things where I could make potentially people look bad if somebody thinks they're they're going to get fired because I hired a pen tester to come in and get in and use them to uh, to to break into my facility um, and that person gets fired. Um, Nobody's going to trust me ever again, right? Go, go, let's go back to that that, that trust slide. Um, I need to find that balance within myself. Um, I, I think it's a real struggle, but this is something, um, you know. Again, um, I, I'm going to keep uh, looking at it, and I'll let you know again next year. You know, I, I, I wish passwords were more like biometrics, right? So uh, biometrics, you know, they have a, a factor of error built in. Um, this, is, this is a fascinating concept to me. So yeah. Um, you know, I, I, again, as as a part of my security awareness thing, I, I've, I've given away free uh, fingerprint scanners to people. So I, I want people to have that that great experience. Um, you know, the security of password scanners is potentially suspect, right? Biometrics is not perfect. Um, but again, I, I think you know, again, quoting my wife, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. I'd love it if if we had a password you know tool within Microsoft or whatever that you know, if I have a thirty character password. Let me get one character wrong. Like if I fat finger one time, I don't want to type that stupid thing again. Um, 
uh, so you know, I, I think again, think, thinking maybe a little bit differently uh, about user experience and designing a user experience that people are happy with is something we want to look at. So pop quiz, uh, uh, survey of the room, how many people have two-factor authentication at your office environments? Awesome. How about for your, your personal account? Awesome. Um, two-factor is the way of the future. If you're not doing two-factor for 100% of your apps, um, that's, that's a really bad thing. Um, we have to move to two-factor. It, it's, um, uh, but I will, I will say um, the reality is um, most organizations, if, if they have two factors, probably don't have two factor enabled for every application. And if you don't have two factor enabled for every application and you have an eight character password minimum, that's a problem. Um, you can expect that your passwords are going to get compromised and you can expect that that system, whatever, whatever those systems are, um, uh, you know, even if they're not mission critical, are going to get exposed. And if they can get access to an, any uh, uh, system that's, even if it's not mission critical, go back to my Star Trek uh, friend, Mr. Data, and Locutus of Borg, right? Uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm losing the room. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, non-critical system is, is, is how a lot of people get in. They, they, they use stepping stones to, to, to move through. You, you got it, you got it. Well, I, th I think Taylor is uh, bringing in the rope. 